So now uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Catherine Bell. And, um, I know Catherine. Catherine's studying um, her PhD at, here in Canberra. Um, she's trained as a doula and a breastfeeding educator. And um, there's much to learn about mothering as to be able to support others. She's a birth advocate and a consumer representative with a keen focus on communication. As the birth cartographer, she uh, authored the birth map, boldly going where no birth plan has gone before. She lives on Feral Farm in New South Wales, Australia, with her husband and four homeschooled children. In her spare time, who knows that she would have any, she's undertaking a PhD. So welcome, Catherine. Um, I'm going to hand over the microphone to you and... Um, Fabulous. So thank you so much. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's absolutely blown me away to see many people here. It's wonderful. It's the glow. So today I'm going to introduce to you the concept of birth cartography, which is all about facilitating communication for enhanced shared decision making. And this is a uh, concept that came about from my experiences as a mother and then a ruler. And it all began with the approach to birth, this systemized approach that we have to birth where women are placed on a metaphorical conveyor belt. They feel really processed, their options and information, and they often don't realize that there are alternatives to how this is playing out. In addition to this, birth also takes place within a culture where women are uh, taught that they don't matter. They might hear things like, leave your dignity at the door. All that matters is a healthy baby. There are no reasons. Just have the epidural. It's not a competition. And so they carry this, this sense with them into that maternity ward where the purpose to get in there, get the baby out and move on. There's no sense of um, honour or respect, which is what dignity actually means. So it really struck me odd. We're asking women to leave their respect at the door. So the uh, result of this is that power imbalance. This uh, power lies with the care provider who becomes the authority. They're controlling the knowledge, they're controlling the time, and they're carrying the weight of liability. And the women take on this um, sense of um, the patient rather than someone with, with a sense of agency. In this agentic state, otherwise referred to as a trance of essence, the Dempsey, the, the mother and partner, when they enter the hospital, just do as they're told. They, they rely very heavily on the care provider to guide them and in a, make the decisions for them because they don't know what they know and they've got no sense of, of agency or power within that space. Because of that, um, with this medicalisation of birth, in the 1980s, the birth plan was introduced. And the idea of the birth plan was that it would balance out this. It would bring into that space variation, an ability to document um, what was happening for the woman and what was um, important to her and give a sense of confidence to both parties. But unfortunately, in the 40 years that the plan introduced, what we've actually seen is a situation where you either love the birth plan or you hate the birth plan. And in some places, the birth plan is, um, is very problematic. In other places, it's a little bit more accepted um, and quite able across the, the, the world. Generally, the problems with the birth plan plan simply around the lack of communication. Most women are creating their birth plans away from the care provider using the internet, using friendship groups, using, 
using resources outside of the uh, care provider location, so the first time the provider sees the plan is usually on the day of the birth. When things are happening and it's a little bit inconvenient to stop and, and read um, the plan. And because most women are birthing with continuity of care, there's that develop relationship and have that ongoing conversation that actually um, you know, makes a plan unnecessary because everybody knows where they're at. And on top of that, the word plan is to be a problem. People hear plan and they think it's fixed, it's immovable, it's regimented that we're, you know, we've got a one-track mind happening. And so it's often suggested to use wishes and preferences instead. And the problem with this is that wishes and preferences are something that are easily dismissed. So it takes away the women's power because now we're saying, yes, yes, we like you, you've got to say, but it might not happen. So also tell them that they need to be flexible. And while being flexible seems like a sensible thing, in this context, flexible really means compliant. Please do what you're told because this is a systemized approach to birth and we've got a process to follow. So because of this issue with the birth plan, I came up with a new concept called birth cartography. And the, the first step of cartography was to bring the partner into space. So instead of just the midwife and the woman in isolation, we now bring the partner into this space. And then as a critical point, we bring them all together in communication. And by doing this, we're encouraging the women and their partners to involve their care provider in this process. And absence of continuity of care, which in Australia is about 92% of women, this means that they have to be a very, very active player in this preparation process. So they need the tools in order to start conversations with their providers. They can then document what has happened and ensure that that conversation is built on with each next step by having those tools and bringing it all together, you know, that they understand that they're birthing in the place for them. And if they find they're not in alignment with their, their chosen setting, hopefully they would have plenty of time to change. So this is a process that begins at the very beginning of process. Whereas with birth plans, they're often not even uttered until after 30 weeks pregnancy, which doesn't leave a lot of time if you've had a misalignment with your care provider. Another critical part of this process is that we acknowledge that it's a woman-led process. The woman is the person who makes the decisions. All of these people come together to help her and support her and the midwife provides the aid to her, but ultimately it's up to the woman to make decisions and to own them. And this focus on informed decisions replaces this terminology of wishes and preferences. By giving women informed decisions rather than wishes and preferences, we give her power. We are not saying that this is something that's easily dismissed. We're acknowledging that this is indeed something solid that is based on conviction and research and knowledge and understanding and it is in that can be used to provide informed consent or indeed informed refusal. And all the people involved understand that it is informed and so we can move currently knowing that we're not going to be liable for something. And the reason informed decisions are so important is because it's more than just information. The informed decision is going to be made up of the woman's previous understanding or experience. And if she's birthed before and it wasn't a good experience, that's going to influence how she feels about making decisions now. Likewise, if she had an excellent experience, that's going to influence her. If this is the first pregnancy, what 
actually seen on television. So pre understanding is going to be very variable from one person to the next. Now that she's pregnant, she's going to be exposed to new information, and this is going to include the information received through various tests and procedures that um, are conducted during the pregnancy. Informed decision, she's going to receive new information, which also includes those wonderful tidbits that everybody feels obliged to tell her now that they can see she's pregnant. So she's also going to be receiving advice when whether this is good information or not um, is uh, it's incredibly variable. And she'll also be seeking information actively, whether she's reading books or looking at websites or asking questions of her care provider. Then, of course, that all comes into play with her current circumstances. What are her finances? What's her relationship status, her religious status, cultural staff, um, her birth philosophy? Is she happy about the pregnancy? What, what are the um, circumstances around that pregnancy? All of these things come into play to inform her decision. And it's only up to her and it's going to be variable. Uh, there's no one way. And so this is where the birth map comes in. So we've changed the terminology to map because a map gives a visual of pathways and alternatives. So it, it gives this idea of flexibility without um, taking away the woman's power. And now we're using informed decisions rather than wishes and preferences. We're letting her know that these are points where you need to seriously consider what's happening because informed consent needs to be informed. It's not just about whether or not it feels good in the moment. Decisions made in advance um, are more likely to be informed decisions because they're made at a time of rational rather than in a moment where you're feeling um, very stressed or under pressure. So this particular um, uh, image, you can find it on my website if you want to study it or, or share it, um, but I'm going to take you through it um, step by step. The most important part of the map is the direction, and this is determined by the woman. And the only way we can give her this ability is by actually providing her with the questions to ask. Uh, this is where we, we get uh, a little bit lost with birth planning or birth preparation, is that we're often bombarding her with information without first establishing what she actually needs to know. And she doesn't know what she doesn't know. So by providing her with the questions, she's better able to make informed decisions. And that's where the book that um, I wrote comes in. It's all about the questions um, that I wish I'd known to ask, that women in my mother's group said, I wish I'd been told to ask that. And so it ended up becoming um, a book worth of questions. So there's a lot of questions that need to be asked. The first of those questions begin with how labour is going to begin. So labour could be spontaneous, induced or avoided, and each of these will lead to a different pathway with different options and different considerations. So let's look at the vaginal pathway to begin with. And here we're looking at uh, the um, the, state, the different stages of birth, because then we're, we're talking the same language. We're using the language that the care provider is likely to be working with, and we can get on the same page. Most birth plans will focus on the first stage, particularly in terms of pain management. So I'll use the example of the epidural to, to work our way through the map. So with the epidural, if you are making a decision in the moment, you're obviously going, I want that epidural now, I'm not feeling great, and I know that the epidural can make me feel better because culturally that's um, what we've been taught. It's not um, talked about in, any, in a negative way. Um, but before you get that epidural, you have to listen to the spiel of the anaesthetist because this is where informed consent comes in. And that spiel usually tells you things that are specific to the risks and benefits of the procedure. But what we know from women who have experienced physical birth trauma is that 
if they had been told that an epidural actually led to a risk of an assisted delivery, they may have thought about it differently, particularly if that information had been given to them during pregnancy when they would have had a better understanding of how things, one, one decision leads to another, leads to another, and what their alternatives might be. So for informed decision making, it's important to know the risks of the procedure, but also what comes after that procedure and what the pathway will look like once you've had that particular procedure. So in a, an epidural pathway usually leads to a second stage that is on your back as opposed to being upright or moving around or, or in a bath. So your second stage options will be impacted by what happens during first stage. And what happens during first stage in a birth mapping process is based on an if this, then that set of decisions that are made in advance. So the women know exactly where they are and under what circumstances they're going to change track and which pathway they're going to choose. The third stage is one that does get a bit of time in a, in a standard birth plan, but usually to the level of we want delayed cord clamping and skin to skin, but without specif specifying what that actually means. So for, um, for a woman who has um, specified delayed cord clamping, if she's in a birth location, the care provider may interpret that as three minutes, but for her, that might mean 10 minutes, an hour, or don't cut the cord at all. So they need to be communicating exactly what they mean by that phrase, in the same way that the care providers need to provide more information about the epidural in the context of birth, the woman needs to be able to communicate what she actually needs in the context of the whole big, the whole picture and make sure everyone's on the same page. The third stage is going to be different compared to depending on what's happened previously. Most women, particularly if it's their first birth, they get to this stage and they don't realise that there's going to be an injection given to expel the placenta and what that is and why it's happening. And they don't realise that there's going to be a lot of action around them. The, the image they might have in their head is quite different to what's actually happening. And then that can, re that can lead to that, that sense of trauma. So making sure they've got a realistic expectation helps to reduce that trauma, confusion or stress. If we have a look at the caesarean pathway, you'll see that I've broken it down into four different types of caesarean. And for women to be able to prepare properly, they need to see these different pathways and these nuances. So normally we will talk about planned C-section versus emergency C-section, planned being before labour and emergency after labour. But for birth preparation and for women's um, feeling of, of safety, they need a little bit more information than that. So the before labour non-emergency caesarean is, is the, the planned C-section in, in its true sense. You've got time to talk to each of the care providers that is involved. You may even have the opportunity to have a maternal assisted caesarean. You will know if the baby's done well and will need separation from the mother. You'll know it, what the mother's condition is there's a lot more time to fully understand what's going on and prepare for it. If it's an unwelcome caesarean, then there's more time to get their head around accepting what's going on and making it a really positive experience. The before labour emergency, however, is never going to be a primary pathway. It's always going to be a contingency. And this is when some some a medical emergency has arisen, perhaps preeclampsia, things are happening very fast. It may even be the baby's coming too early. And this is the kind of scenario where we don't want to dwell on it too much, but it is good to have a backup plan so that you know who your support people are and you've got a sense of what's going to happen in that scenario. Who will be involved? What will it look like? What kind of energy can you expect? Where will people be and who, who's going to be coming in? How many people? And if you can understand what that, that might look like, it's not as stressful if it actually starts to happen. When we move into the labour 
types of caesarean. This is where I've based um, this breakdown on the work of Michelle O'Dent, who talks about the two-hour birthing pool test, where if a woman has had two uninterrupted hours in a warm birthing pool to get into the, into the groove of labour but has not made progress, statistically she is likely to end up with an assisted delivery or an emergency C-section. And so he suggests that at that point, there's a decision point that a woman can make to either choose an augmented labour or an in-labour non-emergency caesarean. And he speaks of the difference being the amount of exposure for the baby to the, uh, the drugs that are used for the augmentation and the time that that might take and the exhaustion that the, the woman might experience, that an in-labour non-emergency caesarean leads to a better recovery, a quicker recovery, no one's exhausted, less likely to be separated. So when we take into consideration and weigh it up, the woman can determine which of those pathways feels better for her and whether she wants to perhaps try one pathway for a bit and she knows when, when she can detour. If she's got a really clear picture of what those pathways look like and when she can change track, she knows where she is and she feels more powerful. She has that sense of agency. Then, of course, the in-labour emergency is again going to be um, only ever a contingency. This is, this is the point where things are happening quite quickly and the outcomes may mean separation and, and, and it's quite a difficult post-birth time. And just having a backup ready for that scenario can make it very reassuring for parents. And if they understand what that might look like, if the red button is pressed, what, what does that look like and why are things happening? They build a sense of trust in their care provider and that's very reassuring for both parents. Then the map comes back together again at the post-birth point where in those first few hours and days there are sev several standard procedures. Here in Australia it's hepatitis B, um, vitamin K and a heel prick test. Um, in America we have the eye group and it's different around the world. But when women understand what those procedures are in advance and because they need to provide consent for them, it's important that they are informed properly about what they are and why they're happening so that there's no, no confusion. And it's also useful at this point for just to have a breastfeeding plan. And this, this will be very dependent on what their breastfeeding goals are and they can understand how breastfeeding might be impacted by the different pathways that they've, they've moved along. And this can be a very, very positive um, experience for them to be able to reach their breastfeeding goals and know who their support people are and, and where to get that information. Those are the aspects that get documented into a written, um, a written map, that a document that gets passed on to the care provider and referred to during the birth. But birth cartography takes women a little bit further than that because we know that preparing for beyond the birth is very important. We need to align reality and expectation and ensure that women understand matrescence, which I think is such a beautiful word. And when you understand that it's not just a couple of days and then you're back on your feet, that first year can be very full on for parents and the transition into parenting needs to be a team effort. And this is important for setting up um, support systems that help reduce that risk of, of postnatal depression for partners as well as mothers. And this is about understanding what your family and friend circle of support might be, but also what other support systems might be available within your community. And then we set up um, our parents for a, a much better start and which is obviously much better for babies as well. So what I've found anecdotally so far is that the benefits for women who undertake this process is that they have increased confidence, which comes from better understanding of the system as well as the knowledge that they gain in preparation. And it's improved communication so that because they know the questions they want to ask, they are able to uh, guide those antenatal discussions. So instead of 
um, answering the question. A midwife might say, do you have any questions? And they'll be like, oh, I don't know. They can say, yes, actually, today I'd like to address these particular questions. And then from there, they can make truly informed decisions and provide informed consent or refusal as necessary. I am seeing that this does seem to reduce their intervention, but when they do choose intervention, they're doing it on their own terms and they come out the other side with a positive story. And that seems to be the really critical difference. We want to see women feeling wonderful after their birth. And we do know that it's not necessarily the outcomes itself, but how they felt during that experience that makes the big difference. And I'm seeing this difference in the partners as well. And this, this is where um, by involving the partner um, explicitly in that process, we see their confidence increase and they have a sense of direction because the map gives them an if this, then that set of instructions. And they have a better communication with the care provider. They've built an understanding of the words that are going to be heard. They know what they mean and they know who's involved, they know where they are. And this reduces their, their feelings of trauma that might come from that watching something happen without any, any way of being a part of it or helping and not knowing what to do. So this shifts them from being a protector to a supporter. And the difference here is that a protector is usually a little bit afraid, they're on edge, they're, they're perhaps you know like the caveman marching in front of the the cave waiting for the saber-toothed tiger, everything's a danger. They're on high alert and they're oozing adrenaline, which is not good for the birth space. When the birth mapping happens, they are informed and confident and they shift to this space of being a supporter. They're no longer afraid. They know who's who, they know what's what, and they know what their role is. And that's a very powerful shift. But what I found surprisingly and wonderfully was the benefit to the care providers. Midwives were telling me, I wish more women would do it this way. This was so fabulous. I knew that they were informed. So the informed consent, I had confidence there. Those appointments were efficient and effective. She was asking the questions and I was able to answer them. I knew what she needed. She knew what we could provide. It was wonderful. And it was truly woman-centered care. Even when the appointments weren't with the same midwife, the, team, the midwife team or the documentation that was put into her notes allowed the next care provider to pick up the last care provider left off because the woman knew where she was and she knew where she was going. And so, of course, this means less stress in that working environment. The partner is now an active and supported and informed member of that team and we're all working together. So that, that was to me was when I said, oh, I'm onto something here with the birth map. This is changing things really positively. And so the last slide comes up and we see that by bringing everybody together in communication with a focus on informed decision making, the whole team is now informed, supported and confident. And I'm very aware of of them that we've had and I really appreciate all your um, patience and that you're all still here um, with, even with those technical glitches and so that's the birth map where we boldly go where no birth plan has gone before. We're informed, supported and confident in a team environment and I'm going to check to see what, what questions are coming and hopefully you can all still hear me and we're all gold. Thanks, Catherine. Um, second half of the audio was much better, so um, it was worth you going out and coming back in. And uh, thanks for, you know, really switching onto a new way of thinking about this whole birth plan, um, which has been a bit of a, um, a thorn in the side for a long time with the way it's been received. So um, I love what you did um, with informed decisions rather than preferences. It really, it, and it kind of puts it in a, a legalistic framework, you know, which is much harder to dismiss, isn't it, than your wishes or preferences, as you said. Um, we had lots of um, questions coming up and um, comments. So I'll open it up for questions. If you want to put up your hand, I can give you the mic um, or you can type your question in 
Uh, it'd be good if if some people do some speaking as well. Uh, so so let's hear. Um, Celine, do you want to take the mic and um, ask that question? Um, so Celine's asked about what's the the pressure to consent to the standardised protocols. So we all know, you know, hospitals usually run on protocols that are standard for most people. Um, have you got any comment to make on that, Catherine? Um, the, what I've witnessed and certainly what I've experienced myself um, as a mum, when you are more confident and you express yourself confidently, that um, ability to uh, provide consent or indeed refusal, when you do so confidently, it seems to be easier for the care provider to accept. Um, your level of confidence and conviction seems to, to make a big difference. And I think that that's the, the, this process, because the discussion starts at the beginning of pregnancy, if you're not in alignment with your care provider, if something is really important to you and your care provider because of policy or restriction or the culture in that particular location restricts you, you've got time to seek alternatives or to come to some sort of uh, negotiation around that. Uh, and so it's about having a lot more time and that seems to be the key to make sure that everybody feels empowered. Women gaining power doesn't mean the care provider losing power. It's a win-win-win scenario for everybody. Uh, and that's that's what I'm anecdotally witnessing is that the key is in that confidence that the women feel. Does that answer the question? Thank you. I'm just going to phone Caroline McIntosh. I think she wanted to ask a question. So we have to give you the mic, um, Caroline. Okay, can you see it there now? See the mic? No, you don't? Um, hmm, I'm not sure why. Only they have audio. to they they have to click on the blue phone and enable their microphone. Ah, okay. Can you see because the they came phone? in with no mics. Yeah. Radio. Thank you, Lorraine. No blue phone either. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. So, um, do you want to type your question, Caroline? Oh, I'd love to hear your lovely. Uh, your lovely accent, though. <laughs> no, you know what? <laughs> Have you got a question you want to type? Uh, maybe while um, Carolyn's typing, there was something from Joe Carter earlier, Catherine, um, that asked, "How do we get started? How do we do it?" Well, the. The key part is that women actually have the questions, which is um, what I provide in my book. Um, so that the book is the tool that gets the conversation started. Um, the uh, my website contains a lot of extra information for those that are keen to um, try and embed this into their um, into their processes. But and it what seems is the website, to me, Catherine, that, I might put it up oh, for you. Sorry. Yeah, bellabirth.org. I can I can type it in there as well. There we go. Yep, that's it. Yep, perfect. Um, the, um, so on bellabirth.org, um, I've got a, a copy of the map um, explained there and um, details of, of how it all, all comes together and how you can embed it into your programs. But the, the critical part is that women have their, um, their side to play. And I, I liken it to building a bridge that happens, like the Sydney Harbour Bridge was built from both sides of the harbour and it needed two sides to come together and meet in the middle. If, if it's all clinical or all with women, they don't tend to meet. So birth plans tend to stay with the women and clinical policies stay over on the, the hospital side. 
what the birth map is aiming to do is bring those things together in a way where we can be truly woman-centered but realistic. If a woman is choosing to birth within a medical system, she needs to understand what that's actually going to look like and that it's not necessarily um, reasonable to expect that she's going to have a natural birth within that system. It's going to be very difficult. So she, if, she, if that's her goal, she needs to be able to prepare the best um, scenario to, to lead to that, that goal and also to be able to uh, understand where she is on the map. So it's kind of like walking through a zoo where you see those um, you are here um, dots on the map. You know, you get an image in your head and you know where you are at each time. And if you want to see the gorillas, you know the pathway to the gorillas. But if the feeding time's already finished, that option is no longer available, you can work out how you're going to move through, it, through that particular landscape. And if you need to avoid the lions, then uh, <laughs> you can uh, be better empowered to do that. It, and, it reminds yeah, as, me... Uh, Joe, uh, Um, Joe Carter's um, question about um, the fragmented care where you only get that 10 minutes, that's where having those questions to ask, um, the women can make those appointments really efficient. And it's about the woman being able to work out exactly the, the questions she wants to ask so that she can make those appointments really efficient. Um, and then between appointments, she can fill in the gaps. So that, that's what I'm seeing that this process does is it really brings the whole lot together and makes those 10 minutes really efficient. That, that's probably a good um, place to close that off, Catherine. Um, it's it's 10 to when we've got a few um, mm -hmm. housekeeping lives to go through before we set up for the next one. But I want to thank you um, so much. I think these conferences are about stretching our, our minds and being introduced to innovative ideas and, and you've done that for us today and um, I want to thank you very, very much. So um, join oh, me everyone in, in a virtual clap and an elbow bump. <laughs> yeah.